We're off on another adventure, this time to China and Southeast Asia. This time we're doing things a little differently. Our trip is being planned by Asia Highlights. After discussing our interests, they have arranged all our transportation and hotels throughout the trip, along with our own private tour guide and driver in each city. We start off in Beijing, where we're met at the airport by our guide Rico, and are driven to our hotel to settle in. We were surprised that all the hotels supplied you with toothbrushes and toothpaste, this one in a somewhat entertaining style. Having some daylight left, we headed toward Dongdan Park, where people were dancing and singing karaoke. Some were playing a hacky sack like game with a feathered shuttlecock. Looking for dinner, we saw this popular place, so we went in and ordered a couple of noodle bowls. After trying some samples at a nearby bakery, we stopped in and bought some snacks. Most of the candies seem to be made out of dried fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Our first full day starts off with a visit to the Mushinu section of the Great Wall of China. Our plan is to ride the chairlift up to the gate near Watchtower 6, then hike to Tower 1 and back, before taking the toboggan slide back down to our starting point. Well, there's a bunch of chairlifts over there too. Oh, there's the toboggan we're going to ride down. That's a pretty long toboggan ride, I think. Once we're on top of the wall, there are spectacular views on all sides and some very steep sections of steps. So how much of this brickwork and stonework here is original and how much has been replaced? Oh, uh, well, so the wall we see now and uh, renovated and rebuilt in uh, 1984 by the central government. But, I mean, the bricks, you know, they are pretty new, but the stone was uh, largely re rebuilt and renovated in Ming Dynasty from 600 years ago. One of the most impressive aspects of the wall is its sheer length. You can see it wind from mountain range to mountain range. But this is only a small section of the whole wall which covers most of China. If we had the incentive and the time, there are many areas of the wall in this area that we could explore, and a lot that you can walk on that hasn't been restored. So it's now time for a ride home on this toboggan slideway. The controls are easy. Push forward to go, pull back to stop. Making it to the bottom, we treated ourselves to a Bundaberg, our favorite Australian ginger beer. After lunch, we're back in Beijing and visiting the Temple of Heaven. For me, this brings back memories of the replica at Epcot's China Showcase. This used to be called the Temple of Heaven and Earth, but when they built a new Temple of Earth, they changed the name. It appears to have three levels, but there's only one level with a high ceiling. The structure is made totally of wood, with no nails. And unique to this temple is that the roof tiles are blue to represent the heavens and sky. Inside, there's several columns and eight cows and mangers, representing the Chinese lunar calendar. Across the way was the Beijing Ancient Architectural Museum, which had wooden models showing how temple design had changed throughout the years. It also had a large cutaway model of the Temple of Heaven. That night we went to the Red Theater, to see a kung fu show. It was a story of a young boy who grew up to be a kung fu master. We start the day off in Tiananmen Square with its massive line to see Chairman Mao's mausoleum. Luckily that's not on the agenda. As we walk through the square we pass by the monument to the people's heroes. Rico described it as the hilt of a sword thrust into the ground 
representing the end of the struggles of the revolution. Prominent in the square is a large floral display of bougainvillea along with yellow and orange chrysanthemums. At its center is this 50-foot flower basket. All this is temporary and is left over from last week's national holiday celebration. One thing you can't get away from are the cameras. In China, you are watched everywhere. Ahead of us is the Gate of Heavenly Peace, our entrance to the Forbidden City. And uh, this area encircled by 10 meter high city wall and uh, surrounded by 52 meter wide city moat. So the Forbidden City you know, was uh, well protected. So in the old time we believe that so after people died their soul can become, it could become a ghost. So the ghosts or evil spirits, you know, spirits. So that's the main reason they put the line in front of the important building. So that means that this place is a very decent place. So <laughs> never, you know, being you know disturbed by the evil things. So the Hall of Supreme Harmony, it was the most important building in the Forbidden City. At each corner of the roof, you can see there are 10 small animal statues. Okay. You see that? Yeah. So the number 10 also indicates the highest level, the most important building. And the rest of the building, there are maybe 7, maybe 9, maybe 5, maybe 3, maybe 1. So much less important than this one. And this hall also known as uh, the Hall of Golden Throne. So the Empress Golden Throne is still inside this building. Mm. Yep. Around the city were these brass pots. They contained water and were used for fire prevention since all the buildings were made of wood. This is the Palace of Heavenly Purity. During the Ming Dynasty, the Emperor would sleep here. He had 27 beds, so no one ever knew where he was sleeping. This is a bronze of Bishi, a turtle dragon, born of fire, here to protect the city. These are traditional Chinese bottles that have been painted on the inside. The skilled artist must paint everything backwards with a brush that's bent at a 90 degree angle. We bought one and the artist painted our names on the inside. This is the Hall of Clocks and Watches. It has about 200 items on display, most of them gifts from other countries. Our final stop is the small Imperial Garden. As we leave the Forbidden City, we see the artificial hill of Jingshang Park. We head up the 330 steps to the pagoda to get a view of the city. As predicted, the smog started building in the afternoon, affecting our view. We were surprised how often we attracted attention being Westerners, especially after we left some of the big cities. Besides being a pedestrian mall, Wang Fujing Street is also a snack street. It seems to primarily cater to tourists, but we are tourists, so we took a look.
some of the food seems to be presented for shock value, like the deep-fried scorpions and silkworm larvae. Intermixed with these dare you items, there's some tasty treats. These are deep fried potato spirals, and we tried a mango drink with a meringue topping. There are also package stores selling colorful snacks, mainly candies made with dried fruits and nuts. Back near the hotel, we stopped in at a high end mall called M Cube. Well, it's our last day in Beijing, and we're off to a local district called Dongsheng, which is near the Forbidden City. This is an area where the guards and people who serve the emperor lived. We start our tour with a touristy rickshaw ride. Well, at least it's better than walking. Our first destination is a residence, giving us the opportunity to see how the locals live. Traditional houses are made by wood. So, uh, so they built the building based on the uh, old philosophy, because the old philosophy is in the old days, so people, they thought, the living people lived in a wooden area according to the five elements. So, Wood indicates the east direction, and the east direction indicates living. It was a little strange walking through someone's home, but it was interesting to see and learn about it. Next, we're visiting the Bell and Drum Tower. The bell is the largest in China, at 23 feet, and is rung by swinging a six-foot log into it. But we're heading across the courtyard to the Drum Tower to catch a performance. The tower originally had 24 drums, of which one of the originals is still on display. After the performance, we try some candied hawthorn apples. Our final destination in Beijing is the Summer Palace and Gardens of Virtue and Harmony. It's more attractive than the Forbidden City, sitting on a lake surrounded by trees and gardens. These are lotus plants, with the lotus flower being culturally significant in China, and is one of the eight precious things in Buddhism. This is called the Long Corridor, and it separates the gardens from the lake. It's highly decorated, with over 14,000 paintings adorning the wooden structure.
These are cloisonné enamel plates. They're made by attaching wire to a bronze plate. The space is then filled with mineral powder. It is then fired multiple times, and the minerals form an enamel glass. The final step is to polish it smooth. This one actually came home with us. As part of our tour, we boarded a boat on the man-made Kunming Lake. It allowed us a better view of the many buildings like the Temple of Longevity Hill, the 17-hole bridge, and much more. Again, the air quality was poor, so visibility wasn't that great. We have a late lunch before catching our five and a half hour bullet train to our next destination, Xi'an. During the ride, we get our first glimpse of the many apartment buildings that are going up, actually condos. There are hundreds of them, but it looked like a lot of them were still vacant. We were told there are about 900 square feet, usually two bedrooms and one bathroom, and you can only own them for 70 years. It's amazing how many of the buildings are lit up at night. And it's not just a static display. A lot of them are moving and changing colors. Some even have video. Our ride to Xi'an goes quick. We arrive at around 10.30 at night, giving us enough time to settle into our hotel for our two-day visit.